Welcome to the third in our five and five series. Today we're uh, on a blanket bog in the Wicklow Mountains on Liffey Head Bog. We're standing at about 500 meters altitude. Um, and so what we're going to do today is look at five plants that are typical of a peatland habitat. So we're going to start with the heathers. And the first one we're going to start with is this beautiful pink flowered heather here. This is the cross-leaved heath or Erica tetralix and it's found on wet acid soils like this bog and tends to grow in these clusters like this. So if we look at Erica tetralix, the, the cross-leaved heath in a little more detail, we see it's got this dense cluster of these pink flowers, these classic uh, flowers in, in the uh, heather family which are sort of bell-shaped and completely enclosed with a very small opening. Um, and it has very small needle-like leaves. And these, this particular species has got leaves in whorls of four. There's four leaves attached at any point on the stem, um, hence the name tetralix, Erica tetralix. And one of the important things about this is you can see plenty of stem between the leaves, and that's an important diagnostic characteristic comparing it to other heathers. Now, the, the other heather we want to look at at this site is the ling heather, Coluna vulgaris which is probably the most common, most widespread heather. And we see it, it's, it's the large bushy plants we see around, but you can see it intermixed in with the Erica tetralix. But it is very different. There's often get confused, but when you see these two plants side by side, you see how very different they are. So when we look close up at uh, Coluna vulgaris, the ling heather, um, at this time of year, it's only just coming into bud. It's not in flower, but it has uh, pink flowers, similar to the Erica. But the difference with the flowers is they're, they're open and it's quite unusual for heather flowers. Rather than being the sort of bell-shaped flower you associate with heathers, um, these ones are more open, the petals are more separate. So it's a very different looking flower. Um, the other thing is the leaves are very different on this. The leaves are actually tiny. Rather than being needle-like, um, they're actually very small. And now, although that looks like a leaf, that's actually a side branch. So if we take that off, that side branch is then made up of many, many small leaves. And the important thing about this is it's, you don't really see the stem very much in this plant. And that is the big difference with the Erica. And when we put them side by side, you can see how different they are. You can see all this stem in the Erica and the leaves are small, but quite distinct. In the Coluna, the leaves are absolutely tiny and they're pressed into the stem. Um, and so this is really the key characteristic, as well as the flowers. Here in the Coluna, the flowers are spread up the stem. Here you get the flowers at the end of the stem in a cluster. So they really are quite different when they're together, but often quite hard to separate when you don't have them together. So this is Coluna vulgaris, and this is Erica tetralix. Well, one of the other species that's, that's important on peatlands we want to look at here is a, it's, it's tiny, it's very hard to see, um, but it tends to grow along the edges of pool systems like this, or wherever there's bare peat, damp bare peat, and it's a fascinating plant. It is a carnivorous plant, which means it actually captures insects to supplement its diet, which is important for these low nutrient habitats. And it's a sundew, um, Drosera rotundifolia. And it's this tiny little plant here, but it has very distinctive red leaves. And here's one I've carefully excavated so we can put it back into the bog so you can see it more clearly. And it's got this rosette of circular leaves um, and along those leaves are these red hairs, and these red hairs are sticky, and that's what traps the insects. And then we see the young flower developing here, just in the bud phase, and it has um, a head with, with a, in this case, two white flowers, two or three white, small white flowers, very beautiful plant. Um, and when the insects get trapped on these sticky hairs, the hairs fold over, and the leaf tends to fold over. It's a more passive rather than an active system of the, the, the insect thrashing around, pulls the, the leaf in on top of it, and it gets digested. But it's not a very fast growing plant. It's not a good competitor, which is why you always find it in bare peats. Uh, it can't grow on the main body of the bog because it'll be outcompeted by other things. But this is Drosera rotundifolia, uh, the sundew. Okay, so this plant we're going to look at is, is the bog cotton, or sometimes referred to as cotton grass. Um, there's several species in Ireland. It's uh, Eriophrum vaginatum. And the way we can tell this from the other species is this is the only one that has a solitary flower head. The others have, have multiple flower heads. And in fact, what we see here 
which is, gives it its name, this, this cotton tuft on the top, is not actually the flower, this is the fruiting body. And so when you pull these out, these are the seeds, the individual seeds, which then blow away in the wind. Um, now, although the name is, is cotton, it's not related to the textile cotton. Um, however, in, in the past, it's reported that this, these tufts were collected and used for stuffing pillows and things like that. The other characteristic of this plant are the, the, the leaves. The leaves are very, very fine. And again, this distinguishes it from some of the other species of bog cotton. Very, very fine, thin leaves and the single solitary head. So this plant we have is a, a very typical bog plant. It's called the bog asphodel. It's got this beautiful flowering spike with several flowers on it. You can see the buds up at the top and, and the flowers developing from the base towards upwards, these yellow flowers. The bog asphodel, uh, Narthesium ossifragum, and it has um, the leaves at the base are very flattened, almost like a, a grass, but um, they're curved, they're sort of scimitar shaped. It's very characteristic for identifying it when the plant isn't, isn't in flower. You can see these curved like leaves. The name ossifragum, Narthesium ossifragum, means bone breaker or fragile bone. And it's reputed that uh, sheep or cattle grazing on land that this plant grows in will end up breaking their bones. And, you know, it's, it's not so much the plant that's the problem, it's just this plant grows on peatlands which are very, very low calcareous soil. There's no calcium in these soils really. Uh, they're very nutrient poor. And so animals grazing here never get enough calcium and so they tend to have brittle bones. Hence the name Ossifragum.